To try to decipher the new Brazilian president, we welcome from Rio de Janeiro, Felipe Moura Brasil. He is a journalist and author with us here in the studio. Andrea Murta is the director for North America at Jota News. Tiago de Aragao is the director of strategy for Arco Advice and editor of the podcast Brazil Politics. And Paulo Sotero is the director of the Brazil Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Let us start in Brazil, in Rio, with Felipe. And Felipe, uh, Bolsonaro, as we've been saying, is a very controversial leader. He's made some very radical statements uh, during the election campaign. He's made statements about race, about homosexuals, about women, about how he would counter rising crime in Brazil. Uh, some have called his views very repulsive. What can we expect from President Bolsonaro? Well, it's nice to be here. It's an honor. Thank you very much for this invitation. Bolsonaro, yes, he made tough uh, statements in the past. Uh, he had these declarations that I consider sometimes stupid, but he never had actions that corresponded to this rhetoric. And when you see in the big picture, he is like a rudimentary guy that speaks sometimes in a, an exaggeration exaggerated way. So uh, he never uh, was saying that he will kill homosexuals or, or black people or human and he was demonized uh, uh, because of these statements. But when you see the big picture, when you see his videos talking to uh, some gay people or human or black people that were not activists uh, he talked to them in a good way, friendly. Uh, there was too much hysteria by the media right. about those statements that, was, uh, that were in the past. Okay. So he, he, he is now saying that he will make a government for all the people. Paulo, do you buy this, that Bolsonaro is uh, going to rule as a moderate, that all the controversial comments we've heard was just election rhetoric? No, no, he's not going to rule as a moderate. He is a conservative, and he has raised the important issues uh, in the Department of Values, uh, about family, and I think he will have to respond to his, especially his evangelical base, in a rather conservative country. I think Bolsonaro will certainly, and we hope, revisit some of his statements, his election, disproves a statement that he made early in his career saying that you would solve nothing in Brazil through elections, that you needed uh, a civil war uh, and killing 30,000 people, starting with President Cardoso, to solve anything in Brazil. So the Brazilian people have shown uh, yesterday that if you believe in democracy, if you follow the rules, uh, you be maybe uh, uh, you know uh, recompensated somehow, and I believe that he started to tone down his rhetoric. He will not be able to govern uh, using the uh, various Serbic uh, and divisive rhetoric he was he used successfully uh, to uh, get elected, and he kind of conveyed that yesterday in his first statement as president-elect. Andrea, what was the attraction for Brazilian voters? Uh, this is a president who won pretty convincingly. Well, I think increasingly in Brazil what we have is a public that's divided between pro- and anti-workers' party people, the PT as we call them. And yesterday it became very clear that people rejected the, the, the workers' party. I think that was stronger than a vote pro-Bolsonaro and his platforms. I think what we also saw is that public that first chose a candidate and then adopted his, uh, his campaign policies or his, his rhetoric. So we have a sort of a follow the leader style of politics here going on in Brazil. At least that's what it seems like up until now. And we're going to have to see if that is uh, confirmed going forward. Uh, but it was clearly an anti-establishment vote in an anti-Workers' Party vote. Uh, I think more people are celebrating the exit of the Workers' Party from government than actually the rise of Bolsonaro, per se. So it was anybody but... Uh, business as usual? To a number of people, yes. Of course, Bolsonaro does have his following as well. There are a number of conservative policies, like Paulo mentioned, that uh, do gather support among Brazilians. Uh, Brazil, uh, contrary to popular belief, is actually a conservative country. 
we have been seeing certain polls, uh, uh, even grow, uh, growing in um, identification with uh, even more conservative policies, actually. We are not sure yet if this is just a reflection of a divisive election or if this is something that is going to stay. Uh, but it could be just that, you know, as I mentioned, that they are following the leader that they chose. And in that sense, I think it's very important for the new leader of the country to come out as soon as possible and uh, speak in a manner that unifies the country and pacifies the divisions that we saw in this election. Tiago, uh, this election, like many others, of course, many others around the world, was fought on a number of issues. But uh, one of the issues that we heard the most about was rising crime in Brazil and violence in Brazil. Uh, let's listen to part of what the new president had to say about countering crime. Let's watch. Let me be clear. Weapons don't generate war and flowers don't guarantee peace. That's a pretty controversial solution, isn't it? Well, uh, I think this is a symbol of a potential solution that can come up. Of course, we have crime is the major, one of the major problems in Brazil, if not the major. We had 62,000 homicides last year. And these are numbers of a civil war. Um, but his narrative and his approach towards security has to be way over and way different than simple slogans of making analogies between guns and flowers. He needs to present very strong legislation. Uh, he needs to uh, support the local polices, the local military polices, and the local civil polices, which are state-controlled and state-administered polices in Brazil. And he must create all the necessary resources, intelligence-wise, budget-wise, in order to reach that solution. Simply arming the population is not necessarily the way to gain that. I understand very well, and amidst the desperation of many of Brazilians right. in relation to violence, that this can seem like a fast and effective solution. But even if this is to happen, uh, it has to be in composition with other policies because by itself it won't solve. So let me get this right. Uh, if he is saying that the way to counter crime is to uh, basically give the police more arms, give the police more powers, is he talking about alleviating poverty, which in many instances leads to this kind of crime? Yes, I think it's a combination of long and short term uh, solutions. The long term solution is divided and it's agreed Right. basically among everyone in Brazil, even the opposition and the current new president, that education is the route outside for that. Short term is where the divergences start to, to appear, and the short term solutions presented by uh, President Bolsonaro are the ones that are directly in confrontation with the short term solutions presented by the candidate that lost. We have to see that by itself, weaponizing and giving weapons to the population to fight crime it's something that can backfire if it's not accompanied by something more robust in terms of legislation and in combination to a general educational environment and the strengthening of the police and more than that, of the law uh, uh, and the law enforcement. All right, let me go back to Felipe in Rio. Felipe, one of the big criticisms we've heard about Bolsonaro is that he is a threat to Brazilian democracy. And as we pointed out in the introduction to the show, you know, Brazil's democracy or democracy was restored 30 years ago. Critics feel that um, he could be a threat. He has threatened to jail his political opponents, to ban political parties. Do they have a point? No, uh, when they say he's a threat to democracy, they, they don't have a point. Uh, Bolsonaro is a deputy for 20, 28 years and was never a threat to democracy. Of course, he had these statements, tough statements, uh, but he's, he's not a threat. He is counting on good minister, good people that uh, is, he's making a team with them, and he will try to reduce the size of the state that was increased during the Workers' Party. They created 43 state-run companies when there, uh, where there was uh, corruption, corruption schemes that was discovered by car wash operation. Uh, during the military regime, which Bolsonaro sometimes defends, and that's one of the reasons he's demonized, uh, uh, the military has created 47 state-run companies. And this is a regime that is demonized by the left as a right-wing regime. But the right uh, often wants the state to be reduced. That's what Bolsonaro is going to do. He will uh, try to privatize uh, state-run companies, not all of them, uh, with uh, the economist Paulo Guedes, who is 
uh, he indicated for the, the ministry. Uh, and that's what he, he's trying to do. So all his speech was uh, against corruption, against criminality. And that's why people voted on him. And yes, of course, I agree with uh, the statement before that people are tired of Workers' Party government. They really made these corruption schemes in the state-run companies in Brazil and Bolsonaro uh, will come to power because people didn't want Workers' Party anymore. So we have here more than 60,000 homicides per year in Brazil. And Bolsonaro showed he was worried about this. And he showed this uh, during a decade. Uh, while the other politicians were, were worried about other problems. And yes, uh, Brazilian people are conservative in majority. All the surveys show that they are against abortion, they are against legalization of drugs, and Bolsonaro gave these s statements too. Uh, so he was uh, more interacted with the feeling of Brazilian people than other politicians. So Brazilian people made their choice. Andrea, I want to get to one of the issues that uh, Felipe raised, and that is Bolsonaro's approach to fixing the Brazilian economy, to getting it back on track. Um, as Felipe pointed out, one of his chief economic advisors is Paulo Guedes, who is a champion of liberal policies. So could we see more liberal policies being implemented? Could we see uh, basically state-owned enterprises being privatized? Some of them, I believe so. I think there is already an impetus uh, uh, from several sectors of the Brazilian society and politicians to privatize part of the, the state-owned companies, yes. I think we shall definitely see uh, proposals uh, that go in that direction. Uh, making those proposals a reality, though, is another um, issue. A lot of the things that are being proposed, they require constitutional amendments, uh, which are not impossible in Brazil, of course, but they require a higher number of votes in Congress and a very strong coordination with Congress people. A lot of those Congress people, one of, uh, first of all, are new to Congress. They're going to have to learn the ropes of the business there. Uh, a lot of party leaders that used to negotiate with government are out. They're not going to be in Congress next year anymore. So a new style of relationship between executive and Congress are gonna, is going to have to come about. Um, and finally, you have, even among Bolsonaro supporters, uh, groups that are around him, uh, some you know, do not by all of that liberal uh, proposal anyways. You have, for example, farm caucuses. You have military people that are traditionally more nationalist and are not necessarily endorsing all of the most liberal policies that will be proposed. So we shall see those proposals arise for sure, but whether or not they're going to be implemented will depend a lot on the new government's ability to negotiate in Congress. Paolo, how does the new president fulfill these promises that he's made to the Brazilians to give them a better future? The country's gone through an economic downturn, a recession, there's widespread corruption. The Brazilian market, stock market, in fact, did go up in the wake of his electoral victory. But, uh, all right, let's listen to part of what he had to say. Let's, let's watch this. The federal government will have to take a step back and reduce its structure and bureaucracy by lowering waste and privileges in order for people to take many steps forward. What do you make of it? Well, I think uh, he is probably sincere in what he is saying. Easier said than done. Brazil is a country that where the state has historically had an enormous impact. Brazil is built by the state. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, Andrea was saying, uh, there are in the military nationalists that will have somewhat of a saying more now than in the past to privatize companies. Bolsonaro himself has already indicated that there are the strategic uh, companies in Brazil, like Petrobras, like Banco do Brazil, uh, like Eletrobras, this is the exact same adjective used by the Workers' Party to justify not privatizing companies. He will have certainly uh, more options to do that. He has to debureaucratize Brazil as the World Bank has been insisting for years. Brazil is one of the most difficult countries on earth to do business and it requires uh, you uh, giving, getting rid of regulatory things that really hurt investors. Uh, the Brazilian government, the current government, through its Chamber of Foreign Trade, has identified a number of issues, a number of measures that could be taken now without having to negotiate them with any government. 
to reduce barriers to trade in Brazil. Brazil needs that. Brazil needs to build confidence among investors because Brazil desperately needs new investments, new money. The state of Brazil is broke. It doesn't have much room to run. Uh, there is a social security crisis that will be upon us in two or three years. And this is, and he will be judged uh, by his capacity let, to address let ask, those. Let me ask you this very quickly, Paro. Is there a risk here that by adopting these liberal policies or neoliberal policies that Brazil could suffer the same fate as many other countries, that there could be a widening e uh, income gap, a wealth gap, widening equality, basically? Well, inequality in Brazil has not been addressed, uh, even during the times where, uh, during the Workers' Party, where yeah. poverty was reduction, inequality was not redu reduced. Uh, and uh, this is the challenge. This is uh, where uh, we need not a divisive kind of uh, uh, approach. We need to bring together. Those are difficult things to do. We have the knowledge in Brazil economists, technicians, engineers in many different parts yeah. of society, but you have to bring them together, for instance, to just give an illustration about public security. My concern is that maybe we have had a lot of tough talk, yeah. but no actual plan on what to do about this. This requires engagement. This is a scientific thing to do, and I don't think tough talk will not resolve, and the problem is that those now are president-elect Bolsonaro's problems. Okay, Tiago, uh, you know, the focus is now in Brazil. We see the outcome of this election. There is outrage from some quarters that a person like Bolsonaro has been elected. But we look, if we look at political trends around the world, Brazil is not an outlier, isn't it? We've seen leaders like Bolsonaro being elected in places like, uh, well, here in the United States, we have Donald Trump, Italy, Hungary, India, Narendra Modi. Um, this is what Bolsonaro had to say about President Trump, actually. In, 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 in many respects, we've, we've heard Bolsonaro being compared to President Trump. But this is what the new Brazilian leader had to say. Let's watch. I'm an admirer of President Trump. He wants a great United States. I want a great Brazil. So is he part of this trend, or is he someone different? I think it's uh, partially yes, partially no. Brazil is a very self-centered country that does rarely looks outside to get its examples, particularly on politics. When we look at Russia, when we look at the Philippines, even when we look at Hungary, these countries are countries with weaker institutions than Brazil has. So the ability for the presidents in these countries to extrapolate their power is much higher. And in Brazil, the proof of that a democracy functions is when the candidate that is not perceived as the best one by a large part of the population, not the majority though, is, is still can be victorious and can still work with a Congress willing to do that. But what I see is that the global trend is that the speed of information is so fast that populations and societies are demanding faster responses from their governments. And by demanding faster response from the governments, bureaucracy is still there as a problem and that leads to populism because populism yeah. is the fastest way for you to satisfy the demands overcoming bureaucracy and as in fast food you provide a fast food type of politics in which your immediate demands are delivered to you at the spot. Felipe, is President Bolsonaro going to be able to govern? I mean he is president of Brazil but he doesn't control Congress how difficult is that going to be for him? Well, now that he was elected with the majority of the votes, as I, I've been saying for months, the politicians use uh, to, to, go, uh, to, to become an ally of a leader that had a majority of the votes. This movement is, is being done, and so now he might have he might has, uh, 30... Uh, no, so 300 uh, uh, deputies uh, as allies, uh, so he might have this uh, uh, this capacity of of being a good governor, uh, a good president, uh, to advance his agenda in Congress, uh, because people are getting next to a leader that had the majority of the votes. So the press was during all this electoral. 
uh, run uh, asking Bolsonaro, how are you going to govern uh, if you are uh, an anti-establishment politician, if you say all these things you say about the establishment? But he had the people beside him. So now he is in, in a kind of comfort uh, position and he's trying to have, of course, more and more allies to, to have this agenda advanced in Congress. Andrea, um, do you see Bolsonaro as a person who can reach out to the opposition, who can make the necessary compromises to, as Felipe put it, advance his agenda? Uh, you know, as uh, Paolo told us a moment ago, uh, on issues like public security, he's going to have to engage. He definitely has to engage now ends the period of campaigning and begins the period of real government, which implies that you're going to have to negotiate. Uh, his party and his party leaders have said up until now that they are not going to talk to certain sectors of society, including the, the Workers' Party and their supporters. I think in the long term they're going to have to make a few concessions here and there. I think that it's important to remember that Bolsonaro does not have a blank check to government uh, uh, going forward. He was elected with 55 percent of the valid votes, but the actual, if you count uh, the whole universe of Brazilian electors, he had 38 percent. So it's not a blank check that in the entire society is behind what he's proposing. I think he actually has a small window of opportunity to prove that his policies can be implemented, that he can move Brazil in a better direction, especially in the economy. Um, and that is going to require a lot of negotiation with Congress. So I don't think the path is as smooth as, as maybe he, he thinks himself. Tiago, how does the president exploit that small window of opportunity that Andrea is talking about? Well, the most important point is to have the legislative on your side. Uh, Brazil is a country, as I said here in, other, in a different occasion, Brazil is a parliamentary system disguised as a presidentialist system, yeah. in which the parliament is as powerful or more than the executive. So without engaging, without negotiating, without opening up to, to rival parties and even to parties that are not ideologically aligned, it's imperative for you to reach structural reforms. To approve conjectural pro bills and proposals, Bolsonaro already has the numbers. But to propose a structural reform, for example, for the pension reform, you need 351 votes, and he has around 300, 310, 320. So he will need to negotiate. And to negotiate, he needs to uh, adjust his narrative in order to, to do that. Because uh, it's easy for the parliament, it's easy to get the majority. It's extremely hard to maintain the majority in the Brazilian parliament. Go ahead. It's easy, but it's also expensive. Uh, you have, in Brazil, traditionally, you have to literally buy votes in Congress. You have to attract people, and Brazilian politicians tend to be very pragmatic in that respect. It, they, those things sometimes are negotiated openly in the media. Uh, what this group needs in terms of access to public budgets, to patronage jobs, and uh, to pledge allegiance. Mr. Bolsonaro, in that sense, he's much better than the failed President Dilma Rousseff, who said she was not going to negotiate with Congress, she was impeached. Uh, he has been a congressman, he knows Congress, we hope, and he knows that he will have to negotiate. That here is the secret. He's very well prepared uh, economic advisor, Mr. Paulo Guedes, said in an interview that he was not going to talk to members of Congress about conditions. He will have to, otherwise you don't govern Brazil. Parliament, as Thiago mentions, is very powerful. And uh, we do not know exactly who were the people now there. Uh, we all hope, obviously, there is renewal, um, younger people, uh, more honest people. But the game is kind of predicted on those negotiations, mm -hmm. and the leader has to set the standard. Can I add something here? I think it's important to remember that he got elected on a platform of being different, of not uh, being bowed to Congress in terms of give and take that is traditional of uh, Brazilian politics as it has been until today. So when he needs to start doing that, when he's required to do some negotiations, we have to see how his supporters are going to react as well. So that also shortens that window of opportunity that I was talking about. Okay, and that's where we are going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us.
But that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.